if I can create a video that makes someone feel something where they're like, that's enough of my phone that I don't feel like sucked into the loop. I need to put it down. I need to think. I want to go for a walk. I want to like talk to my parents. I want to give someone a hug. To be able to get someone to break from the loop of their phone, so powerful. And if I can like tap into that more, like just cool. It's just cool. Max, thank you for coming on the podcast. Really grateful and honored for you to be here and excited to dive into you and your story today. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Hell yeah. Let's start with the origami summer camp. Oh, come on. <laughs> um, wow. Good job. Thank you. That's great. Origami summer camp. So my mom is a professor. And so I spend like- At the, Duke, right? Yes. Um, and so I spent the first like seven or eight summers of my life living in Paris because my mom would have her study abroad programs and she'd bring the family along. Um, and so after Paris, it was Montreal. Um, so we did like five summers um, as a kid living there. And my mom would send me to these like summer camps. Um, and at the time I was obsessed with origami. Funny enough, Joey, a friend of mine here, we make like the same like Tekra, like Hedron, like origami things that take like three hours to make. <laughs> um, but yeah, origami was a huge obsession of mine. And funny enough, the first business I ever started was selling origami. So that was like the origin for all this entrepreneurial stuff. What about origami made you so excited? Mm. I think part of it was like the mathematical element as well. Of like paper is very like flat, two-dimensional. But the fact that you could like fold it into something and bring it together and see it like come to life, I think is very satisfying. But then even for my brain, it was like, just the intricacies of like building it. I don't know how to explain it, but like, um, it's just satisfying. Yeah. Satisfying. I don't know. That's so cool, man. And it's like, when you think about yourself and I'm sure we'll get into the art and the entrepreneurship of your life in general, but when you think of yourself as like an artist and or entrepreneur, mm. where do you put yourself on that spectrum? If like, let's say a hundred you're starting at 100 as artist mm -hmm. and 200, let's say, is entrepreneur. Where along that spectrum are you? It's interesting because it, it has almost been like a bell curve of sorts, like, like a graph. Like throughout time, I think in the beginning, it was like entrepreneur. You know, like I ran businesses and then I just like happened to make videos. Like I never associated myself with the identity of like, I'm a filmmaker or like, I love movies or I'm obsessed with the craft. It's just like, yeah, I'm making videos, you know? <laughs> um, but business is what always made me tick. Um, and so even in the beginning, like I wouldn't, I didn't consider my videos art. You know, anything I put onto the world as art is just like I'm documenting and then I'm starting this clothing brand and those, they're all very like entrepreneurial ventures. Um, only until I met Ryan, funny enough, did I start to think of like, didn't, it was like the shift from like, I remember sending Ryan a video, you know, because I looked up to him like, Ryan, your videos are incredible. You went to film school, like, give me some advice. Most people, I send them a video and they're like, oh, that's great. Ryan sent me this whole ass thing of <laughs> notes. It's like, fix this. I felt like you just like threw on music and you just slapped it on there. Didn't add anything to the story. Didn't add any emotion. You know, you know, what are you trying to make people feel? And I was like, Oh, interesting. Because normally the way I've approached YouTube in the past or when I would have a blank slate, it was like, what do I want to say? As opposed to what do I want to make people feel? And when that shift came and then when I thought about music in a different way of instead of just adding on some like lo-fi kind of music in the background of like, oh, I can like manipulate people in a negative way, but like how can I add another emotional dimension to the video that makes people feel something that I think my content shifted into more of like an art form. Um, and then even more recently as my like content has evolved, I'm like, okay, like this is like, this is like art now <laughs> for me. I've been in like disbelief of like being an artist. Like I don't feel like an artist, but I'm like, no, oh, like, no, like I think this is art, you know? Um, and then now I'm like, but running these businesses now and starting new things, I'm like maybe I am more entrepreneur, but I can't tap into this art side. So I kind of like fluctuate, but I think I'm in denial of like the artist that is within me because I feel very business minded. Why? I don't feel like my idea of an artist in my mind, which is like purely like 
the crazy artist, the emotional, the person who feels, who like isn't logical. Because there's a part of me that's like very rational, um, very interested in money and finance, not for like to make money, but like the mechanics of how money works. I like that where when I think of artists or even my friends who I consider to be pure artists, like ah, money, I don't want to think about that. For me, I'm like, you know, <laughs> um, so it's like an idea that I have. Yeah, no, it's super cool. And I want to highlight the part about where you sent Ryan the video and he gave you all these notes mm -hmm. and it, it just talks about and it highlights to me the importance of getting feedback from your work, but also reaching out to yes. people. Yes. How has that played a, a role in everything you've built? Huge role. Uh, and I think, you know, when I first started my whole like career on YouTube and sorts, it was a very individualistic process. Um, it was just me in my room, you know, trying to find a sense of community, but th I didn't even know how. Like, I didn't realize I could DM someone and ask them for advice or to get on a call. Like, the whole, like, idea of networking didn't exist in my mind um and it was only like a slow process of like oh I, I can't do that oh they're cool oh wait I want to like do more of that you know um I think that's something I only really discovered like a year and a half ago two years ago um I forget the original part of the question um but uh oh like asking for feedback asking for help it's like a it's a permission thing as well like I've learned to give myself permission to ask for help um, but it, it's still like a, there's still tension there. How, how have you given yourself permission? Some of it's like probably at its core, like ego, of course. Right. I feel like I can do everything. I want to have my hands in everything. And, um, I think as I've gotten to know myself better, maybe through things like journaling or just getting to like having better relationships with friends and people in my life. I realize the differences in our personalities, which allows me to realize more of who I am. You know, like Ryan's more like this. I'm more like that. That's cool. But by understanding like the difference, like through the contrast, I have a better understanding of who I am. Um, and I think that better understanding has allowed for my ego to dissolve. Cause I'm not trying to be anything. I'm not like, I'm okay with it. And being okay with something allows me to be like, yeah, maybe I'm like, maybe 90% of like a good filmmaker. I'm never going to be Ryan, never going to be Natalie. Like, that's fine. Like I, I enjoy it. Like I have fun. And I'm not like afraid to ask them, you know, cause I'm not trying to be the best. I'm not very like competitive anymore. I think that's, that's probably it there. I'm like learning things already. It's like losing the competitive aspect, which is tied to ego. It has allowed me to ask for help. That's beautiful. There we go. I, <laughs> I really like that because it makes me think of a story from Gary Vaynerchuk where he mm. talked about he never reached out to anybody. He always mm. let the opportunities come to him. Sure. And then Kobe Bryant died. And he said, damn, that is somebody who I would have connected with if I had dropped the ego of myself and reached out to him. Yeah. I could have reached out to him, but I, I didn't want to because I wanted to be seen in that moment. I wanted to, him to reach out to me. And it's like, there's there's some ego there, and it's yeah. remarkable that you've been able to understand that about yourself. At how old are you? Nineteen. Nineteen. Exactly. And I'm still learning. Like I'm not perfect by any means. Like there's so many years in my life that I could reach out, you know, ask for help. But I'm making slow progress, which is good. I'm sure that in any time you're interviewed or any time people see what you've accomplished, people are like, dude, you're 19. Like, this is crazy. Sure. You're going to the standards and you're going to a place that most people haven't been their entire lives. And you're breaking that at, at 19. So obviously it's going to come up. How do you think about your age? And, and l let me bring it to you for, sure. to give you some context for my own life. It was like, I was 15 years old writing Nick's blogs. And people were saying, this kid isn't 15 years old. He is, he's a parent who's impersonating a child. So I'm very familiar with yeah. the place of like people being shocked at my age for the sure. things I'm accomplishing. Sure, sure, sure. And it pushed me away. Kind of like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be involved. But like, how, how do you take the age of yourself yeah. and how has that impacted everything you've created? I forget about it most of the time, but when people do bring it up, I'm like, I don't know, like. It's just me, you know, but I think all of it goes to my parents. I mean, some of it's like you get deeper, like the psychology of maybe some early childhood thing or a personality type. Um, but 
I don't know, like, I think I just was raised really well, which put me in great positions, which allowed me to just, like, flourish and think I could do things, and then I did them, and then it worked out, and then here I am, and I met incredible people, and so I don't feel like it's something I did. I'm just, like, I just, like, got here, but, like, a lot of great people that took me here, but, again, like, the age thing I just, not that I, like, shrug off, but, like, there's no, like, formula. I don't know. I don't know. What do you think your parents did to instill confidence and this understanding of like, I can do this? So my parents are like different in many ways. So my mom is again, like professor, like academic, kind of like deeply ingrained in like the bureaucratic of like the uni- you know, university side and all that stuff and institutional side of education. And my dad is for more of like a pure creative and like very deeply like an intuitive person I'd say um very like passion driven like he's very energy focused less of like here are the rules and so like having both of them as my parents incredible like I won the lottery with parents like everything is because of them um obviously I want to give myself some credit but like in terms of like a a baseline I think it was really nice to have that like push and pull of like max like follow everything that you like you want to do and believe in and then having my mom to be like yes and like still keep some doors open for you like there's been clashes in terms of our relationship when it comes to like education um so like having that push and pull like allows me to make my decision because I feel like I can fall somewhere like in the center or sometimes like society more my dad's side or my mom's and um and so yeah it's like the two parts of your brain you know like the rational side of it and also like more of the emotional side um and having that balance but then like love and support is probably what it is like on my dad's side like I just felt so much love from them that's like probably what it boils down to so take me to the scenario where you you're not going to class in a particular day because you're you're taken by an idea and you're in the flow state and you get into a big argument with your mom about it what is that moment like and what mm. spurred that story from for happening I even remember this junior year of high school is my environmental like uh science ap like course whatever it was it was beautiful outside it was like spring um before everything shut down because of you know pandemic and such um it was beautiful and i think i just like had this like idea and this like feeling and i was just like i can't go to class like i can't go to class like i have to go outside i want to like read a book or i'm thinking about something and I remember I, I think I like biked back home even and like I saw my mom and she's like what are you doing I was like mom just like trust me she's like what like what do you mean like you have class like, what are you doing I'm like mom like it's a feeling like it doesn't make sense and so there's always been that clash of like this like weird intuitive like I just like I can't like I need to like give myself space right now um and that's happened with school sometimes <laughs> what what is that feeling it's kind of like horse blinders of like Nothing else like matters right now. Like very much like I'm in my own like complete world in my mind. I just like have to be there. I can't be like brought out of it. And it is like kind of it feels somewhat selfish of like I don't want to like exist in these rules. Or like sometimes I like have this tension with like authority that like like, like surprises me in some way where I'm like I don't like that. Like don't tell me what to do. Um, or I like to question these rules and stuff and like pushing away from it also feels good. Of like not going to class like. It feels like I'm not being like scandalous, but like kind of like rebellious, which gives you energy. It like it's the contrast with like I'm pushing away from this, and by pushing away, like I'm forming my identity of like this is what I believe in, um, which is like you know I guess some like childhood like early development of like how we you know figure out who we are and such. And so there's some of that like young childhood self in there as well. I don't know if that was like makes sense, but um, yeah. It definitely makes sense, 100%. How has spending so much time looking at yourself impacted you and changed you? Mm. I don't know if I can answer the question, but the question is something I think about and it kind of scares me because I don't know and I don't know if I will know until I look back in 10 years and I'm like, wow, like you spend a hundred of hours like analyzing your life, building these narratives, um, watching yourself grow up, but then kind of playing this third person view perspective and like controlling that as well and like how much of me and who I believe I am is me just editing that stuff like being able to edit your life is a very weird position of power to play and you know we walk around telling ourselves 
these versions of our lives and these stories. But then to like edit them, to publish them into the world as well is like a whole nother dimension that's very complex. Um, and I don't know if it's good or bad, and I don't want to view it from that lens, but I think it's very complex. Um, but also like good in many ways, you know. I feel like watching myself grow up for the past couple of years and spending hundreds of hours analyzing myself plays into the, you know, maybe some of the maturity or like, how are you able to do this at this age? <clears throat> it's like, I feel like I'm pretty self-aware of a lot of things um, just because of that force, like introspection. Like, why did I go on this trip? What am I thinking? Why am I thinking that way? Um, but only time will tell. <laughs> well, I like to say it's like a, a crazy experiment that's running. That oh, yeah. Never sure. before understood. It's like, <laughs> imagine the mirror gets invented in the society. It's like, well, that's going to change how people think about themselves. They're going to understand how they look. That's going to make them want to appear more beautiful. That's going to make them look at other people and judge them. It's like, okay, now let's do that for video and let's do that for audio and let's bring the mirror and make the mirror social media. Mm -hmm. It's like, there's some amazing aspects of that. There's yeah. some terrifying aspects yeah. of that. And I don't know what to make of it. Yeah. It's like some four dimensional mirror that like you look into it and then also like it has scale, like the world. It's like every time you look into the mirror, the whole world sees you, Oof, you know, and it feels like the entire world, but it's, it's actually just like one fraction of one fraction of one. It's like, dude, your videos could get a million views a video. Mm -hmm. And that is like, what what percentage of human beings yeah. have actually seen that? But it feels like that's a, a massive amount. Yeah. And it is. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's both such a small amount and such a big amount at the same time. Yeah. How do you think about that? I don't. Why not? The digital side of like, you know, just numerics if that's even a word just like numbers that you just i just don't feel that was one of the biggest things i actually hope to feel <laughs> you know on the early days of starting out i'm like 100 000 subscribers 10 000 oh that's gonna feel amazing oh my you know um and you dream about these numbers and you know it's not great but it's just part of those early days where you, you're fixated on numbers I don't, I don't think it's always bad but um Every time I've gotten to one of those milestones, I'm like, oh. You know, I walk around. I remember thinking, like, I had, like, 100K on YouTube. I'd probably just walk around and life would be, like, 10% better. Like, I feel kind of like I'm, like, dancing on, you know, on life and skipping around and such. And I just don't feel it. Like, I don't feel it at all. Like, I don't carry it. I don't think about it. But I will say meeting people, like, finding those numbers for a moment it like it like flashes your brain what a, like you know when you uh you know those like markers i forget like the technology but if you put it in your skin and then you have like the uv light and it like lights up it's almost like that but imagine like everyone is invisible they all have the uv stuff on them and then suddenly like the lights like the world goes dark for a second and then you like see everyone around you. That's almost what it feels like because it makes it feel real. Like it makes the other like 500,000, you know, subscribers I have feel real for a second. When I do meet one of them, that is the way I put it. It's almost like fireflies or something where it's like, oh, everyone does exist because I met you, you know, only for a very brief second though. Um, but yeah, I don't really feel the numbers. I don't really think about who's going to be watching my video for the most part. If so, it's like, what is my mom going to think? You know, am I being a little bit too vulnerable? They're like, oh, like, you know, my aunt texted me last time or my neighbor texted me the, like, like my video, you know, like that scene was a little risky, you know, <laughs> everyone else. I'm like, eh. <laughs> it's so wild when creators meet the people who their content impacts. And a perfect example of this is like, there's this podcast called My First Million. Mm -hmm. and, and My First Million was talking they, they recently had a meetup in Vancouver. Okay. They, they sold out a stadium or a theater of a thousand people. Oh, uh, and they were like, oh my God, like I didn't expect this to happen. Mm. And I know that's going to happen. It's like, sure, they're, sure. they're just like, they have a strong resonance. They have an amazing podcast, yeah. but they didn't realize it. Similar, Joe Rogan in 2014 or 2015 plays a stadium and he's like, how many of you guys listen to the podcast? And everybody goes wild at the, wow. at the stadium. And he's like, Oh my God. Really? He's like, <laughs> and, and of course, but when it's numbers on a screen, you don't think about it. Yeah. But when it's human beings that you see, you're like, holy smokes, this is real. This matters to people. 
this impacts people. And then it's like, how do you navigate through the place of this matters to a lot of people, but also like, like I'm not, I'm the shit, but I'm not shit. Mm -hmm. And, and navigating and holding those at the same time. Yeah. How do you do that? Honestly, for me, I think like following doesn't really correlate to ego. Like, I don't think I'm the shit because I have followers. Yes. Um, which I'm glad. <laughs> um, for me, it's just like, oh, wow, that's so cool. It's more of like a communal sense of like, I feel very detached from the, the community in some ways of like, like, wow, there's all these like cool people who sh- share a similar like sort of sense of belief or approach towards life. And it's just cool that that exists. Um, but I don't feel like I have ownership over that community or I control the community or that I have power over the community or that they're like worshiping me in any regard. Or like I'm some leader and this is my influence. Yeah. It's more of like, wow, like I have a lot of friends yeah. and I just haven't met all of them yet, but it's fun to meet some of you guys. And I know there's so many more of you out there. And every time I have met someone, I'm like, wow, like you're so cool. Damn. There's like 500,000 more of you. Like that's just like cool. Not like, Thanks for following me, you know, like buy my merch, you know? (laughs) Yeah, no, that's a a great perspective. What do you want people to feel after they finish watching one of your videos? So I recently had a a cool opportunity. One of someone who did follow and like, you know, watch my videos as part of the TEDx committee at Rutgers invited me to speak. I mean, this is like whole, whole process of like me struggling to figure out what I talk about, you know, all this and part of the talk I focus on this like metaphor um the majority of the talk is kind of comparing the food industry to social media um and uh one of the things I compare art to on social media is like a good meal like a well-prepared meal so think like a steak asparagus mashed potatoes like something of substance you know um and I would consider that art on social media versus like maybe TikTok thirst trap whatever like the mindless content is like you know empty calories um, you know, when you eat a lot of empty calories and you're just eating chips, you just want to eat more and more and more. You don't feel satisfied and you just like, you end up regretting it and you don't feel great, but you just keep munching, 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 munching. If you have a nice meal, you go to a nice restaurant and it's intentional. You don't want to eat afterwards. You're not trying to like munch chips. And I think that same feeling of, wow, I just like digested something intentional that made me feel something like I want to sit with that. I want to like reflect just be present i want to like put down my phone i think that is a very powerful thing if i can create a video that makes someone feel something where they're like that's enough of my phone that i don't feel like sucked into the loop i need to put it down i need to think i want to go for a walk i want to like talk to my parents i want to give someone a hug to be able to get someone to break from the loop of their phone so powerful and if i can like tap into that more like just cool it's just cool yeah, I love that TED talk that you gave. I watched it last night. Oh, really? Okay. And it was it was amazing, and it made, you. made me reframe. Uh, like, it made me understand what I'm trying to do with this podcast mm-hmm. better, which is like help people understand themselves. I'm glad, yeah, and yeah. and put down the phone so that they can listen to themselves or mm-hmm. have a a thoughtful yep. conversation with themselves or with somebody else. Mm-hmm. So I got chills when you said that. What one of the videos that you've done that remarkably well was your drive across the country. Mm, yes, recently. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and then, uh, so I watched your video and then I watched Isabel's video. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh my God. Like just <laughs> having, it was like watching friends, but then like real mm-hmm. and a thoughtful version of yeah. that. And like, I could see it from different perspectives. Mm-hmm. So what went into that video and how did that come to be? And what do you, what are you thinking when you're creating something like that? Yeah, that video is interesting. So it came out of me meeting Isabel at Creator Camp. Um, and then, you know, I thought she was like cute. I was like, oh, interesting. And, you know, I had this road trip coming up and I don't want to drive across the country alone again. Like by then I'd done it two times, three, three, actually, this is going to be my fourth time. And I was like, I can't do that again. I'm going to like lose my mind, you know, but I'm like a hopeless romantic at heart, you know? And the idea of like, some girls like cute going on a road trip across the country for me, I'm like, oh, like that's, that's like takes all the boxes you know like that's perfect that's heck life experience yes yes like i i could like die you know like I, life's life mission's complete um so i remember like tossing the idea to her um i actually like finessed the driving on the way back so that i would 
be in the car to shuttle her back. So I had five hours with her at the end of like camp. And I remember mentioning, you know, kind of like, like yeah, I'm like driving back or driving across country, looking for someone to co-pilot, blah, blah, blah. And trying to like plant some seeds without being like too, you know, too intense there. Um, but she ended up sending me a voice memo a couple of days after camp. I'm interested if you're interested. It's like, hell yeah. Um, she bought a one-way ticket out. And then we set off on this great adventure, 14 days across the country. And it's a really interesting balance because we didn't really know each other at the beginning. Um, so you want to get some to know someone on like a human level, not just like, not like manipulate the experience or extract the experience for content, but there's like a really fine balance of, hey, like I want to live this, but also I want to like capture this, but I don't want to ruin the moment by trying to capture it. And that is very difficult to navigate. Um, and so for the first seven days of the trip, we didn't really film that much. Um, and I'm glad I did that because I felt comfortable filming once I felt like I had a sense of knowing her and it felt a lot more genuine. It's like, hey, I know you now and we got through a lot. Now it's kind of fun to like film things and capture it and like tell a story. Um, so that's kind of how I approached it is let me get to know you first, then I'll start filming some more capturing some conversations some moments but let me focus on like real life first and have that take the priority and then I think it flowed beautiful because we did that and I think what I was able to capture was like very raw and beautiful and people really connected with it because it was real because we'd already established that like human connection in the beginning and so capturing it I didn't have to do anything it's just like set up the camera just film her on my iPhone like eating Pringles and have a cute moment and like it was just so natural I think people felt that because, again, we established that human connection in the beginning. So it worked out beautifully. A couple of things hit me about that video, mm. like at a deep level. The first was when you said to her, who I thought you were was different than who you actually were. Mm. And that's because like in the age of social media, what we're presenting can be different yeah. than what we actually are. And when we get to yeah. know someone at a deeper level, yeah. that can really make a difference. And then... The second part of it was how sad you were when it was over and how she captured your sadness. Mm. And I was, was just like, oh my God, like this must have been a really impactful moment or a time in Max's life because of how deeply you were moved to being upset when it was over. Mm -hmm. How do you think about those things? Yeah, it was interesting. Um, it felt like we've both left our lives and you know, kind of had this agreement to like enter another world together for these two weeks. You know, it was very like reality bending of like, whoa, like I kind of am in a movie right now. You know, like I watch all these movements like, you know, before sunrise or something um, where it's very, you know, romantic or like too good to be true. I'm like, what's happening? Um, and so to kind of feel that bubble like snap at the end, to kind of like break reality and oh wait, I'm like at school now. Like I'm starting freshman year. It's a very like stark like contrast of like, you know, kind of closing this bubble and then kind of being, well, forced to start this new chapter that's a lot, you know, starting a new life, meeting new people, moving into college, obviously coming from a back or a, a gap year, it's a lot. Um, so it just happened really fast. I think it's like sad in the moment, but it took me a very long time to actually process the trip. That's why it took me three months to like actually edit the video and put it out. Um, and not all of it was actual like editing. Um, but just like living. <laughs> um, and I felt like I couldn't rush the video and just edit it because I didn't know how I was feeling right after because I didn't have time to process because I was thrown into so much. Um, and so that's something as well as taking the time to really sit with your emotions to be able to put that into the work as opposed to just like having it be like an assembly machine. Um, I don't know if that answers the question perfectly, but like that was kind of running through my mind is just like entering these different worlds um, and taking the time to process them. I think I only really felt the true emotions at the end while editing, interestingly enough, to really sit with it um, and like process because it did again happen so fast, um, which I'm grateful for to be able to go back and to look at these moments, and to listen to old conversations and to think about how was I feeling at the end and how do I like add the music there or as I fit into the narrative and how do I make the narrative as authentic to the moment as I can as well. Um, so I think very grateful for having this video making side of my life to process these incredible experiences that I've had. A lot of people are looking at your videos and they're 
using those videos as a way to help ground themselves to their own realities. I know, for example, when I was starting fitness and I was starting lifting weights, I would watch people like Mike Vacanti and yeah. Christian Guzman, and I would be like, oh, like they're going to the gym and they're working out like mm -hmm. this. Like this is helping me ground my reality in some way. Yeah. How do you think about being that person for other people? You're that person who is helping people yeah. in their youth and people who are, are older than you understand their own reality better. How does that make you feel? I think it's cool. Yeah. Like I try to be as human as possible. Um, and uh, it's not like, I don't approach it from the, the feeling of like, yeah, people get, can like look up to me. It's again, going to the community of like, now nah, like we're doing this together. Like we're growing up together. It's more of like, let's like link hands and walk across. Not like you walk behind me in line. I think it's, uh, it's more of like, yeah, like this is my life. I'm doing these things. And the more I can kind of like diversify the image of myself, the better. And what I mean by that is the internet, like, you know, even the fitness people, for example, right. You're looking up to them for fitness things. And for me, you know, with content on the internet, there's a lot of niches. Like, you're a school YouTuber, you know? Um, so let me look up to you for academics and such. And for me, I'm like, that's not who we are as humans, you know? Like, we're artists, you know? We do a lot of different things. And the more things we do, I think the more authentic we are, you know, to ourselves. Um, you know, I'm not just a student. I'm also an entrepreneur. I'm a runner. Um, you know, I like to travel and I really like that I've been able to share a lot of different elements from my life and I haven't put myself in a box. Um, I think it's cool, like, if people do look up to me, um, to kind of give themselves, give themselves permission, to be like, hey, I can do this, but also do this, and that's okay. Um, and, like, I have so many clips of me crying on the internet. Like, this is rough. Like, I'm going through something right now, and this is difficult, but also, like, this is great. Like, this is the best moment of my life. Um, and I'm really proud of putting that version of myself out to people. What compels you or what makes you so comfortable sharing those parts of yourself where we've been taught in a world to suppress them or yeah. don't show that or yeah. this is not for other people to see? Like even when I, I notice it, even when people like, like I'll watch Bradley Martin interview someone mm. and I'll watch him start crying mm. when he, wow. when he's talking about how his dad committed suicide and and then in that moment he'll not want to show that he's crying and part of me wants to be like no bradley it's okay you can cry you you can you can do and show what is on your mind and what you're feeling but you're 19 years old and you you know it's okay mm. so why some of it is parenting some of it is also like my friends um you know even in like Montana, we lived there for, for a month, for context of Montana for a month with creators for the first time. Um, it was one of the most challenging months of my life. Um, and uh, I felt so supportive and loved for like my vulnerability. I felt like it was just like, okay, especially like with men to be like, yeah, like it's okay to feel that way. I feel like my group of friends, we really support vulnerability. It's like, dude, you were crying in your video. You expressed that like, hell yeah. Like I'm proud of you. Um, I think we've created a really good culture. Um, I also grew up, a lot of my friends were girls. <laughs> um, so I never really felt like I was in the like toxic masculinity phase of any, you know, within any of those realms. Um, so I never felt like, I felt like it was wrong to share. Um, if anything, I don't know what it was, but I felt like vulnerability is like a superpower because growing up, I never fit in with the jocks or the dudes and never felt like I had a, like a real like friend group that they are. I could hang out with the girls, but I couldn't go to the sleepover with all the girls, you know? Uh, so I was kind of like doing my own thing. Never really felt like I quite fit in, but like, again, like the contrast or like pushing against things to find out your identity. I feel like within a lot of those groups, they're kind of like toxic masculinity and such like the jocks and for me, like vulnerability felt like a superpower of like, I know you guys feel this stuff too. I know you cry, but the fact that I can like vocalize it and show it is like very powerful. And I know, like, I know you're thinking it too. Um, so for me, it was like, this is like a strength, um, not like a weakness by any means. Um, and then just, yeah, having that, like be supported by friends and family, um, just felt very normal. It's human though. Like we cry.
<laughs> like why why suppress that part of yourself that that everyone does and it's interesting like what we suppress in culture and ourselves personally because we think and will be judged by other people but if you can like remove that it creates such a layer of of enjoyment of life like a good example that comes to mind is would when i would start going out to bars without drinking yeah i'd be like oh my god this is a superpower i'm having a great yeah. time by myself and i don't need the mm-hmm. things that other people need and i know that other people wish they could just interact yeah. without the stimulant of what they're or the depressive depending on whatever it is but it's like that that's such a superpower to be able to do what other people wish they could do mm-hmm. and um it just makes you just excited by life to have that truth. Yeah. You mentioned Montana before. I'm curious, like, I know when you, when you went out on that trip, you were like, I'm going to be very disciplined and I'm going to have the disciplined structure. I'm going to wake up at this time, 6 a.m., I believe. Yeah. And, and then it was like, how did you, how did discipline play a role in that trip of helping make it yeah. a, in a reality? Mm-hmm. So the first time I, really lived with a group of people and like had roommates. Um, and so, you know, I grew up as a competitive runner, you know, all through high school, like that was like my world. Um, and so through like athletics and sport, like discipline is a necessity. Um, and then also combining that, you know, with YouTube or running a business, like time is finite, you know, like I got to like be smart. And for me, I'm very interested in like understanding like how I work. Um, so when I lived in France, I got really deep into psychology after a breakup. Um, I was like, how do I just become a better version of myself? But like, how do I understand myself? So reading psychology, you know, getting the cold bass and plunges and reading a lot of things and philosophy and such and 12 rules for life. All of that. Yep. Yep. Jordan Peterson. Yep. Yep. That was actually one of the first. Yep. Of course, you know. <laughs> um, but what were you going to say? That was one of the first books you read? Yeah. That was the first one I read in France after I was broken up with, I was getting tutored and learning French in this English uh, like library cafe in the village I was living in it was on the book section of like psychology I was like oh that looks interesting like 12 rules like I'll read that and then that set off and sparked a lot of different things um for me but anyway I'm very fascinated like how how can I how can I like optimize myself not like a robotic sense but like for me it's like how do I find a good balance of like I'm trying to manage and work with a lot of different emotions and like there's the athletic side but also the energy that i'm putting towards like work or creativity and um how i just make this easier for myself because i think i'm very hard on myself um and uh, i want to m- remove that like friction to have a better relationship with myself and i think i've tried to do so with discipline um and understanding like hey i like edit better from like 5 a.m to like 9 a.m and when I try to edit at like 5 p.m. after I've eaten food, it doesn't really work well. I end up beating myself up. But like, that's not my fault. You know, like, how can I be authentic to myself within my routine, which is, you know, you have to have discipline to stay within that. Anyway, I tried to bring that into Montana, to like ground myself. Um, and so I convinced the boys to wake up with me at six to edit for three hours. And at nine o'clock, I forced them to run with me. I four different types of running shoes with me you know I had my long run shoes my temple run shoes my racing flats um so everyone had a pair of my shoes and we'd run for 30 minutes does everyone have the same shoe size no <laughs> but, you know we made it work we made it work <laughs> um so I got everyone to run with me and then we'd go into this like glacier stream that was in front of our property afterwards um and then we'd go back inside we had three showers um, you know, I would cook the meal while everyone would shower and then we'd put it out and we'd, you know, flip out shower and then we'd all eat together. Um, but I like the balance. I don't know. I feel like discipline like grounds me, but also like having discipline allows me to have freedom. You know, it's like, if I can be disciplined in the first half of my day, I feel great for the second half. Um, and for me, a lot of discipline is just, I needed to have a better relationship with myself because I am so hard on myself. I think that's really what it comes down to. If I'm like being honest. Whose voice is that? <laughs> that is a great question. Um, and I think I'm trying to figure that out. What about you? Where does that voice come from in your mind? The one that's hard on yourself? Probably my dad. Mm-hmm. Probably my dad hold me and held me to such a high standard for everything that I do. But it's been nice to recognize that you know, through meditation. And been able to sit with it and be like, oh, that's an interesting voice. Like, I can use that when I need it. 
I can use that to put out three podcasts a week. Yeah. But I can also use that to enjoy those three podcasts a week mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. So like having that relationship with with myself and the meditation aspect of it has allowed me to recognize the voices and look at them and be like, I can choose and pull on this one now. I can yeah. choose and pull on that one. So that's been uh, really important. And I think it's important to note that that what I found, at least from my own experience, is the harsh voice, the voice that's telling you you're not good enough yeah. or that voice is 99% of the time from someone else. It's not from yourself. Really? Yeah. yeah. Well, because yeah. if you sit with nothingness, like what I found is that love comes up. Mm, I like that. And like you, the deeper you go on yourself, the deeper you realize like all you are is just love. But society, expectations, yeah, sure. other people's voices sure. are what is getting beaten into you to make you believe you're not enough. Mm-hmm. Take me through the five minute mile mm. and breaking five minutes. Oh, how do you do that? This is an obsession of mine. Um, my friend Virginia Prison, shout out to her. She probably won't watch this, but she does. Shout out to her. Um, convinced me to join cross country uh, in seventh grade, um, and I joined it. And I was like, eh, you know, I was like, I was like, okay, but then like, kind of like got better fast. Like, it was a bit of a like natural talent. I was like, at the time I was playing soccer, um, pretty competitively, um, as a goalkeeper. And at the time, tensions on my team weren't great, the communication, the defense, and it was, became very frustrating because the blame always goes to the goalkeeper. If the ball goes in, well, hey, he didn't stop it. I'm like, no, it's because the left back messed up the ball and, you know, the striker hit it in. Like, come on, guys. Like, like it's not my fault. Like, what am I supposed to do? Um, and so it was combined with, like, frustrations of, like, the team dynamics, but then finding the sport of, like, wait, like, I'm, I'm like, okay at this, but I find that, like, if I put more energy into this, I get better. I'm not like held back by anyone. And for me, I'm like, whoa, like that's kind of addicting. Um, so both of those things happened at once. And I think I just got like engulfed of like, whoa, like I'm good. And then at the end of the seventh grade um, season of cross country, we had a mild time trial. Um, I'm like remembering this now. Uh, and I ran 525. Um, and I remember there's some like record or something of like the five minute mile, but it's like this elusive barrier, at least for me at the time, like a five minute mile, like a mile starting with four, crazy. I remember asking my coach, that's what it was. I was like, well, what do you think I could run at track season? She's like, maybe like 515 max, like you could improve 10 seconds. Like that's a lot. I was like, like I felt almost disrespected. I was like, oh, you don't think I could like break five? And I was like, you know, no one really took me seriously because I just started running and such. I was like, I'm going to break five. And I remember spending hours going through these like running forums called like Let's Run, trying to find anything of like, hey, you know, like I'm going to be eighth grader trying to break five in the mile. And there's not that much out there, but I found all these training plans and went out to the woods. Actually, I printed out like all these training, like uh, like logs and mileage plans and workouts. And like for months, I trained by myself. I had, the, you know, my watch would go to the track, um, did my intervals and everything. Um and uh for me it was like can i break five minute mile when i'm 13. um because i was in my birthday was april 30th i was gonna be turning 14 and i was like it's just so cool to do before i you know i was 14. um and uh my first race of the season was a 508 so i was like wow like, i'm kind of close um but that was like individual um or it was like by myself I was like, damn, like how much more fit can I get throughout this season? But like, I need someone to like push me because that like barrier is like very difficult. Like eight seconds or like I needed nine seconds is like a lot still. Like that's, that's a lot to shave off. Um, and so throughout the season, I ran like, you know, 512, 506, like, you know, it's kind of dancing around, but like the clock was ticking. Like I was like, I'm like, I'm, I'm so close, but, uh, it was like April 20th, I'm pretty sure. There's this race against my like arch like rival at the time, really good friend of mine now, Ben Holly. Um, and he was like, you know, the local like legend for running. He already broken five before. I was like, this is like my race. Like this is if I'm gonna get it, like this is the only shot is now. Um so like we race. Um and I remember halfway through it was just like, oh like I don't know. Like I was like behind on my splits. Um I remember seeing my dad there and like Long story short, I crossed and I four fifty nine point nine seven. I saw the foot. I'm like, oh my god, like how, like by a hair. Um, so for me, that was really the first time in my life where it was like an individual pursuit, 
that I learned that like I can do this like if I put energy into something like I can see some form of like success like I like trust myself like um it's just like me like I did this obviously there's like external help and support um but that really taught myself and kind of like clicked like all the other entrepreneurial stuff that I've like come to do now it really stems back to the running stuff of like I do research I put time into this like it's a very addictive feeling um to realize you have like a lot of control over like external resorts obviously like a lot of factors but that's where it all started. It's, yeah, I love that. Oh my God, that's such a cool story. And what it highlights to me though, it's funny you mentioned how you're 19 years old today and you don't think about age, but you were thinking about it at 13. Yeah, oh yeah. And and you were saying to yourself, oh, I, and I think like it also highlights the importance of deadlines mm. on ourselves. Yeah. Like if you said to yourself, all right, I'm going to hit a five minute mile by the time I graduate high school. It's like you could have easily said that and that could have easily informed your decisions and the things you did. My question to you is like, what's your current version of the five minute mile? That's a good question. I feel like I've been in the process of unwinding a lot of that like obsession that like I felt like I needed to achieve these goals that I set out to. But I think to a certain degree, some of it felt unhealthy and obsessive. Like if I don't wake up at six, the day's over. Like I I, I screwed up, you know, or I don't wake up at five now. You know, it's like, wow, like. I'm hard on myself for not achieving or like following the rules that I've created because I know that I'm better like optimized when I follow these rules. Um, so I've been trying to like unwind a lot of the obsession and try to find the source of like my drive to try to f change the source, I suppose, of like out of like obsession to like love, you know, or like community or like building things. And so through the process of shifting my like source of energy, Instead of, like, coal, I'm trying to find some, like, clean energy. It's, like, that sort of thing. And through the process, I've, like, lost some of that, like, obsession. But then again, I'm, like, I, like, I still, like, need some of that. Like, I still need something to drive me. So now I feel like I've, like, I'm coming from a place of, like, love and wanting to do good things. But now I'm bringing back in some of that obsession required to do, like, crazy things. Um, but it's a very tricky thing because I don't want to become too obsessive and, like, lose the humanity in, like, what I'm trying to do because I'm trying to find some success because at the end of the day the five minute mile means nothing you know if i didn't enjoy it or if i'm not a good person um i think that's kind of where i'm at in my life is i kind of like the obsession though. i kind of miss it too so i'm bringing it back um but in terms of like what the five minute mile for me is now i don't know it's just like building some of the businesses that i'm working on um but like for me, it's like a 30, like I know I'll probably like accidentally have like $50 million. It's like not that I'm trying, but I just like, I actually have so much confidence now where the five minute mile like doesn't exist because like I know I'm going to run it. Like I no doubt in my mind. And if I don't, I don't care. It reminds me of something you, you said before, which was about YouTube and success on YouTube. You said, I was relentless in my vision. I was going to make it on YouTube. It had already happened in my mind. It seems like you feel the same way about yep. making $50 million or your own eventual success. Mm -hmm. What gives you that confidence and how do you go about thinking about how the future is going to turn out mm. for you? Yeah. I think the confidence comes from, again, like a relationship with myself and realizing, like, okay, like I can do things. But now the next phase of my life is yeah, I can do things by myself and cool and whatnot, but community and friends so much more important in that, like, add scale to the equation um i don't like doing things alone anymore um and so the group of people i'm surrounded by now oh my gosh like incredible like so fortunate like i won the lottery there for me that's like the five minute mile already getting to like work with these people every day i'm like i won like how did this happen how did i find these people um and that already feels like i've won and succeeded and it's just like you bring good people together doing cool things and everyone's passion and has energy. It's like, it just like happens. Like, I, it's just like every week something crazy happens that is a five minute mile. Um, and you weren't trying. Yeah, it's like, it's I, was, I don't have to try now, you know, but like, because we're like so well intentioned in what we're doing, um, I just like trust. I just have full like trust. Um, and it's, I'm very lucky to have that. Or it just feels great. Like, I really am trying to appreciate it every day. Um, but yeah, there's less of like a fear of like, is it going to happen? You know, 
Um, cause every day feels like it's happening. That's something I've tried to work through myself of like not living in the future too much of like, by the time I'm 30, I want to have like a really cool, like architecturally designed home and, you know, have a couple old classic Porsches and like, I like know it'll happen, but I also like don't want to get like lost in that version. Cause like, I don't need that. Like it'd be cool and fun. And like, I know it will happen. Um, but like, I also want to love this like right now, because that's also the same dream right now. I think that's like a thing for me that I've been trying to get my mind around is like, I'm not going to be happier there, obviously, you know, but like that version of myself still exists now. It's not like it's any different, even though it feels different. Like I have more things or it's a different world that I have. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really exist. Um, and so I'm trying to be more present and like today is actually like the dream, like, which is like hard for me because I'm very like in my mind. I don't know. Does it happen to you as well? Yeah. Like, do you, do you like see like, at like 35, I can kind of picture like, this is what my world will like look like. Or are you like today, you know? It's both. I want to sell out Madison Square Garden and I will sell out Ma- Madison yeah. Square Garden for a live podcast. And I'll be there. I'll be there. I can't wait. But that doesn't make today any less meaningful. Yeah. And in fact, it makes today even more meaningful because yeah. this is a step that helped get there. Exactly. And also like, this is amazing. Like that we can talk right now and we can broadcast this and, you know, a hundred people, a thousand people, 10,000 people, whatever it is that like there, there are people on the other ends yeah. of this. Yeah. And, and that to me is so cool that we're transferring knowledge from our heads into the world. So cool. And people are seeing it and hearing it and it's hitting them at the right time that they're supposed to. So the, the answer to your question is like, yeah, I'm definitely thinking about where I'm going, but I'm also, that doesn't not make me grateful for what I'm doing today. Yeah, it's like the the wild confidence and optimism that I've had with these certain things allows me to enjoy it more. Yes. I'm not like panicking. I'm not like making bad decisions to try to achieve this success be- out of fear of like, oh my God, like I think I'm like falling behind. You know, like, you know, my viewership isn't what I thought it'd be. It's, you know, I'm like behind, you know, like the schedule's all wrong. Like, oh no, 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 no. You know, it's like, ah, oh, it's going to happen. So like, let me just have fun. Like, let me sit back. But also the balance of like, yes, I've like hit these milestones, but like some I also like haven't hit. And the larger the milestones get, the more I'm like, I don't want to be like overconfident, but I still want to like enjoy it, you know, and like know that it will happen. But like, there's a part of me that's like, but like, wait, 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 but what if it doesn't for the first time? You know, like, what if you're like, yeah, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And then that overconfidence means you're not like acting with the same sense of urgency, but also you want to have too much of that urgency so you can't enjoy it. And it's like trusting yourself, but also like not being unaware like having a blind spot i think that's my biggest fear and i was like having a blind spot but i think having friends and good community is like having really awesome like mirrors on my car and like all the lights and stuff so if there's a car there that's like ding 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 ding, you know that sort of thing yeah well i think it also points to the fact that it's like it's not about selling out madison square garden it's not about having the porsche it's not about having that sick house it's about the journey and the process of trying to achieve that. Mm-hmm. And if I never sell out Madison Square Garden, I will truly be happy because of the journey has been so enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. Of trying to. Yeah. It's the try and I'll do that and then I'll be like, all right, what's next? Exactly. What's the next arena? You know what I mean? So it's like when you realize when you accomplish more things, you realize that the place you're trying to go is not actually anything. It's just like a, a marker mm-hmm. along the journey. And that's a super helpful thing to realize. And I think as you continue to accomplish more and more, you'll be like, all right, like, like you said, it's like, all right, I hit 10,000 views of video. Now, now what? Like, it doesn't feel any different. It's not going to feel any different. So understanding that and really holding that makes you be like, all right, like this video that I'm putting out, amazing. This video, amazing. And like, that's, that's really what is, is spurring the connection to the source and and Mm -hmm. connection to the process. Yeah. Talk to me about, how community has played an important role in your life and particularly like how the community that has come to you and that you've built, like how, how does somebody be 19 years old and have the best friends in the world and be so grateful? And like, I was, if I had that at 19, I would be like, damn, like life's good. Yeah. And it took time for me to build that and, and really find people who resonate with me at a deep level. And I resonate with. Mm -hmm. So yeah, throughout high school, everything I felt very isolated I'd never had my like click and it was just like ah, like 
is it me? Like, is something wrong with me? You know? Um, but I would meet people. I'm like, oh, I really connect with you. There's a lot of like older people and I just wasn't around that. And so like, you know, finding community in the beginning, like what it really came down to was like YouTube. And I talk about, I had a conversation about this yesterday of like the internet allows us to use some form of like emotional or like energetic echolocation. <laughs> Dude, that is a brilliant concept of like, when I post a video, I'm sharing my views and ideas and energy out with the world and the algorithm is like really complex and incredible where like people who resonate with that come back and so through that there's like the audience side but then there's also like the friend side where like i saw ryan's video and he put a version out of like you know of himself out into the world that i connected to and i was like hey i'm gonna dm this guy you know and now we're best friends and so i think because i've been like authentic um, or at least try to be as authentic as I can in you know, sharing who I am and how I view the world and those things, it's come back to me. And it's like that form of like echolocation has just allowed me to connect really interesting people from all around the world. Like my friends are scattered all around and I'm so grateful for the internet because of that. Because, you know, I'd probably still be at home or like, you know, wherever I was, um, probably a lot more isolated. But because I think I put so much of myself out there, a lot of it has come back in people who resonate with it. Um, so I say that's kind of what has allowed me to build community at like such a young age because when I look around, I'm like, damn, like this early, like, whew, wow, like, thank God. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's definitely something you don't take for granted and you definitely shouldn't. Yeah. And I think what's so remarkable about that is the piece of the internet. Mm -hmm. You've used the internet to one, understand yourself better and to find people who understand you. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, it's like, what are the odds that the people that resonate most with you are going to be in your geographical location like not the the odds of that are just with the amount of humans on the world yeah it's just it's just not actually possible yeah. for that to be the case mm -hmm. but if you can find places and pockets like and you can put yourself out there it can create an incredible reality it's a hack i think it's cool because it uses social media and tech as a tool um and even my dad and I talk about this. He uses his phone is very much like a tool, like camera, flashlight, text, not like an endless void of consumption. Um, and again, like the notion of creation versus consumption, but then also like social media isn't bad. You know, that's like the, like the, you know, the title of my talk of like, stop trying to quit social media and just even broadly, like these things aren't bad. It's just the relationships with them that like need to change or to alter or realizing like, you know, YouTube isn't bad or Instagram isn't bad. Yes, you could, you know, spend hours every day scrolling, but also you can meet your greatest friends on the app. It just depends on like how you use it. And it's like not to blame anyone. I think we don't know that we can do these things. And I think because of like content creation, like YouTube and putting myself out there, I was like, wait, I can DM someone, but it's also easier because yes, I have followers. They will respond. So it's kind of like been a hack, um, but yeah, this notion of like using social media as like a tool, but then also as like like a natural selector in, in, in some capacity. It's almost like a dating app at scale with like friends in, in the world. And the algorithm is very complex um, and like pretty spot on. What would you say to a 19 or 23 or 25 year old person who feels lonely? Mm. Again, goes back to a conversation I had yesterday with a friend who kind of, you know, kind of felt like lonely, was interested in making content, but felt that like no one would watch his stuff or that it wouldn't be entertaining enough. And he also felt like he didn't have a sense of community. And I was like, dude, like put yourself out there again, going back to like the energetic energy, like echolocation, like the more you put yourself out there, the more people are going to come back to you and be like, hey, like I felt that too. You know, I feel isolated too, or I love this, but like I'm stuck at home in Ohio and like everyone here is doing this and I don't really want to do that, but like I have no one else. Um, I think again, it kind of goes back to like actually asking for help. Um, kind of like reducing that ego of like being vulnerable and putting yourself out there. It'll again, it'll come back. Um, and I think for me, that's what's worked uh, in terms of finding community because if I didn't, I would be a, a lot more alone right now. <laughs> It's remarkable. And I think the real power is the ability to share and the ability to have the confidence to say like, no, my, my point of view is valuable enough to put out into the world mm -hmm. because a lot of people don't have that yeah. confidence in themselves to yeah. believe that their perspective is valuable. It's very sad. Yeah. What can we do about it? 
I don't know. But even, yeah, like the internet's like vulnerability at scale. Yes. Is what it is. Like you can connect people at a human level one to one, but like I can. What was the question? What allows, what, what could we, what could we do to help people mm. be more vulnerable or be willing to share more of themselves? Obviously like leading by example, but supporting people when they do. Mm. I don't know. It's like, I don't know if I have a very like complex answer, but I think it's as simple as that of like finding small ways of like being vulnerable in your day to day or trying to do something nice or looking out for someone and it's kind of stepping outside of yourself. Um, but I think it's just on these like micro levels, I think is where like the change is made. Even with like with my friends, if someone is like, hey, I'm feeling bad, you know, today or I can't show up to this because I'm feeling like this. I'm like, hey, it's all okay. Like, I appreciate you saying that. Um, I don't know. It's hard. I think it's one of the hardest things is being vulnerable and all that stuff. And so, yeah, there's no like perfect answer. It's like a lifelong kind of journey that I think everyone has to work. But I think it's one of the largest issues we do face though, um, unfortunately. Yeah. And I think a huge part of it is like having the, the confidence in yourself. And that's why I feel blessed like you where the parents give you love yeah. and support and you're just like, everything's good. My parents love me. So like <laughs> life is good. And and it's like, yeah. damn, it's like, easy. It's easy. It, yeah. I yeah. wish everyone had that because if yeah. they did, they would share more, which would create amazing opportunities in their own life. Damn. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. Parenting is where it starts. Like, how do we make parenting better like what is the government doing like maybe a license to like have kids or something like what do you think like like how can we make parenting better because that's where it all starts you dude know? this podcast goes to parenting so often and i don't have a girlfriend and i don't plan on having children anytime soon but that's exactly right yeah. i realize how amazing parents have helped me in my own life and i realize like i need to help more people be amazing parents even though i'm not and don't plan to be anytime in the near future sure, sure. but it's the most important thing <laughs> i'm not gonna <laughs> where's the <laughs> yeah god bless exactly um but dude i i don't know parenting and i don't know like yeah. how to but i know that like if i can bring what my grandparents and my parents did mm -hmm. to me which is just like unconditional love for the present moment for myself and yeah. realize like all these humans are freaking amazing man and like really try to do that to people in different interactions giving them little winks of like, dude, you're on the right path. Or like, yeah. like, dude, you're amazing. You're doing the wrong thing, but you're still amazing. Yeah. Like yeah. if I can do that time and time again, that's how I spread what my parents gave to me. Mm -hmm. Just giving people love Yeah, at, on a one-to-one -one, one -one basis. No, I love that. I feel like if there's anything, like everyone can have different beliefs, different religious beliefs, ways they want to live their life. But like, I love that. Like no one can really argue with love. You know, it's like, just like love people more, show them love. And like, yeah. you can't argue with that. Um, I think it's beautiful. So the hard part for me is that now that this podcast has started to pop a little bit and people yeah. are, are listening and watching more, yeah. I can't give love to every person who wants to receive it from me. Mm -hmm. And that's a really hard part. And you have you know, almost 600,000 subscribers and I'm sure you feel a similar way where you can't get back to every single person. You can't give love to the people who want to receive it from you. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? It's hard. I have this, I'll be, I'll be honest. I have this folder in my inbox called like fan mail and like messages I've received to people or questions and not getting back to people. Like I just can't get back to everyone. Right. And I, when I started to get more, it's like, well, like, I can't, like, I feel bad. Like, I want to sit down and talk to every person for an hour, but I can't. So, like, for me, I just put it in a, like, in a folder. For me, it feels like, yes, I'll respond to you one day. Cool. Even though, like, I have not opened it in two years, wow. which is bad. But it feels in my mind, like, it's my way of, like, like, being okay with it. Because it's like, I'm, like, acknowledging them, but, like, I just can't get back to everyone. But if people were respond or like reach back out twice then i do that's like my rule of like if you reach back out twice then like you really care then i'll put the time back into you as well that's that's like my rule like as of now of approaching because most people don't um i don't know if that's like messed up but like that's my way of like uh, like making sense of like the guilt almost that i feel because i want to be present with everyone and be like human and acknowledge them but i can't physically it's impossible to keep up with. And that's such a, dude, I'm going to use that. That's such a useful mm. tool of like, all right, if they respond twice to their message, like that shows an extra level of care and attention that they're giving to exactly. to their, their problem or their query. So 
Yeah, that that's super smart. Tell me about being on Times Square mm. and seeing yourself on there. How did that feel? <laughs> Shout out Eric and Will from Carrot first off. Um, really cool opportunity. You know, it was interesting. I was staying with my friend Elliot. You know Elliot. Elliot Choi. Yep, the boy. Uh, and uh, left his apartment to go and it was like maybe like a 45 minute or something like ride. I don't want to like dox him. <laughs> the wolves could have been an hour and a half yeah hour and a half maybe 10 minutes who knows um you know i, I took a bike took a train walked helicopter <laughs> canoe who knows <laughs> there's a lot of places that are 45 minutes yeah so many places um uh but it was interesting that journey because i was filming some of it like on my phone but you know i was like what am i doing right now like i'm gonna go meet myself and they have this like clip that they filmed, um, you know, some of the team of Carrot there. Like, what does it feel like? Like, I'm like, I don't know. Like, it was weird because I remember going up to Times Square and looking around and just trying to find myself. And then like, I see it and I'm like, that's me. Like, hey, Max. <laughs> like, what? Like, it's very bizarre of like, it's like cool, like Times Square, like flashy built, you know, wow. But like, again, like, I don't feel any of that. It's just like, in some ways, it felt like this, like, journey of, like, wow, like, in some ways, I like, guess, like, I've made it to a degree where I can, you know, have this, like, opportunity or be seen on, like, this, like, platform that has significance. And it was almost like meeting, like, an, like a younger but also, like, older version of myself of, like, you know the scenes in movies where, like, reality breaks or they're in a dream and they're speaking to some, like, ancient wise person or, like, even, like, Avatar, I forget you know, the last airbender, there's some scenes where they're like, talking to some like person in another like portal or dimension. And it felt like, again, like the world got really quiet and it's just like me and myself. And I'm like, you're like, you made it to this point. Like, what does this mean? Like you're here. I don't know. It's like, just like I was meeting myself. I've never like meet myself. Like I do in the day to day of like editing, but there's never that like anticipation. And I felt nerves on like the, the Metro ride, or the subway. Um, like, why do I feel nerves? Like, I'm like kind of weird, like nervous to meet myself because also there's this like expectation to feel a certain way, but I'm like rambling now. But um, it's very odd to go on this journey to like, see yourself. Um, but there's like some significance to that journey. I think that's kind of what I was trying to make sense of. A huge part of that is tapping into yourself and your emotions and your feelings. Mm. How do you do that? And a journal. That's like pretty core. Um, tapping to emotions. I don't know. Again, like video making is like a, a, a lot of that. Um, I think it's also just like the way my mind works. I'm very just like, like, why do I feel this? Because of, you know, this or this happened. And part of what my childhood led to this, like the psychology, like that's technically my major right now. I'm a psych major. Um, so I think just like those mechanics of just like understanding myself like I'm very curious I'm like why am I like this like why do I feel this way why did you do that like that doesn't make sense you know like try to it's just me trying to make sense of the world and myself and my place in it um I think it's just a bit of curiosity how you feel right now there's a lot going on um literally yeah um it, it feels like a I know these things are going to be really significant in the grand scale, but it's cool because they're very like young, like Circle Park, the business I'm running, Ryan, Asher, Joey, Creator Camp, uh, Simon, Chris, Ryan as well. We're like very early and I know these are going to be very significant as time goes on. So it's really exciting to understand like the significance, even though it's like so early, but also it's like there are hard conversations, like even today, like, you know, in the meeting, like I wasn't fully present because I stayed up late last night and there's a bit of tension there. And like, I'm like messed up a little bit. Um, it's so like raw. Um, business is very raw and you, it's just so like people focused and there's so many personalities and um, you just have to be so open. And it's just this process of like, I can't like hide anything. It's just me. Like I can't, it's just, I'm, I messed up on this and I have to say it and I apologize for this and or I'm really good at that and like let me shine here um it's like I can't run away from myself in, in like any way and part of that's like scary but part of it's really good and like honest it's like I'm looking at myself and that's me I can't lie um and my mom has this quote from like her yoga uh, and it's 
Wherever You Go, There You Are. Wherever You Go, There You Are, an amazing book by John Kabat-Zinn, which everyone should check out as well. And that is kind of like what I feel. Like I can't escape. Yeah, I'm like traveling here, going there, running this, doing this. And it's just very like humbling, um, but like kind of chaotic as well. And so I'm trying to like enjoy the chaos and kind of like dance with it. Um, so that's kind of like how I'm feeling. Well, this conversation shows that you're doing a remarkable job at it from my perspective. Just Thank one you. vantage point. Thank you. And I'm really grateful for our time and your energy and your wisdom. So... Thank you. Keep going. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Thank you. I like to end these podcasts with a challenge, and that is asking the guests for a challenge to leave the audience with from everything we spoke about or something we we haven't covered. Does anything come to mind so that people could take some sort of action Mm. and and do something from our conversation? Yeah, immediately. I'm like, tell someone that you love them that you haven't told like in a while, whether it's your grandma, your mom, or your friends, like. Life is hectic and it moves fast, and I think we forget, um, even though it's a very simple thing, um, do it to as many people as you can. If you can tell them 10 people you love them, oh, 20, extra credit, 100, like, hell yeah. Um, And even, like, people you don't know, like, cafe, you know, like, little small acts of, of love, I think, would make me feel good. Dude, this is why we get along, because someone asked me what I would put on a billboard last week, and yeah. I said, go call someone that you love and tell them you love them. I love that. So we're in sync. I appreciate you so much. Where should we send people to connect with you further? Uh, Watch some of my videos on YouTube. If you search on my name, if you want to, we can hang out there. (laughs) Linked below. Thank you so much, Max. Thank you. Take care.